What is a product owner? What are they responsible for? Today we take a deep dive into what it means to be a product owner. Product owners are an important part of the Scrum team and a key role in development teams for many organizations. Have you ever wondered what a product owner does? You're in the right place. Monique Darte Jones is a digital product owner, speaker, and innovation leader driven to solve society's top problems through technology. For over a decade, she has built a career focused on customer service, digital marketing, and IT development, supported by education in business analysis and product management. Her goal is to continue to be an evangelist for people of color in technology and use her platform to highlight diverse voices in our communities. Welcome to 100 Days of Trailhead, where the tech community comes to learn Salesforce, learn tech, get inspired, and invest in ourselves. We are your trail guides, here to support you on your learning journey. We release videos weekly. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a video. In the description below, you can find links for everything we mention in this video, as well as books and resources we found useful. Visit our blog, 100daysoftrailhead.com, for other helpful Salesforce and tech content. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you for joining me today as we explore the role of the product owner. Um, this is a key member of the Scrum team, and um, they uh, manage the relationships and maintain the balance between um, the development team and business uh, stakeholders. And part of the reason I call you know, the closer, they're the ones who ensure that uh, the technology um, takes the vision that comes from the strategic business plan um, and backlog and um, turns it into actual functional technology, um, guiding the development team through the process. I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Monique Jones and I am a digital product manager, speaker and innovative leader. And my passion is identifying ways to solve today's problems through technology. I've been working in the technology space for over 10 years. And um, in the last five years, I have um, uh, climbed into a position of product owner and I, I just love it. This is a space that I really enjoy. Um, I thoroughly um, have delight in um, taking technology and working with um, development teams and um, executing um, key business plans um, in ways that creates wonderful user experiences for individuals out in the community. And so again, Coming back to what we were talking about today, what is a product owner? For many people, uh, there's a lot of definitions, um, a lot of um, personal interpretations of the role, um, but from a Scrum standpoint, there are key uh, characteristics and um, strategies that need to be identified um, from the start. So a definition that I got from scrum.org defines a product owner, um, which is being accountable for maximi maximizing the value of the product resulting from the work of a scrum team may vary widely across organizations, scrum teams, and individuals. A product owner is also accountable for effective product backlog management. So they're the ones who are prioritizing, identifying, and um, laying out um, the strategy from the development standpoint. So they're identifying the order of how the technology is built and also um, ensuring that that order is reflective um, from the product roadmap and what the business stakeholders are looking for um, within you know, a, a year potentially a uh, multi-year strategy, but they're making sure that that falls in alignment in realistic standpoints with that timeline. Um, this also includes developing and explicitly communicating the product goals, um, creating and clearly communicating um, product backlog items. So making sure that the team really understands um, the stories that are being created, the user stories, and um, exactly what functionality should be included in those items. Um, 
This also includes prioritizing ordering the product backlog items as I've talked about. So making sure you're putting the proper features, the proper functionality in the order that it should be executed in and making sure that falls in alignment with the overall strategy of the organization you work for. And then ensuring that the product backlog is transparent and visible and understood. So this is something that um, you know, needs to be very clear. Um, all team members need to know what that guiding light is. Um, so they need to know where they're going, how they're going there, and um, when they're going to get there. And so that's one huge thing as a product owner. You're constantly having to communicate with all your different team members to make sure that they understand um, what plans of execution need to be happening at what time. And um, also um, making sure that the technology team understands the overall um, goals of the business and um, the business team understanding potential limitations, um, potential um, opportunities for maintenance that needs to happen from a technology space and making sure that's incorporated as well. So those are very key um, discussions that are constantly need to be had. And um, sometimes they're opposing. So you have your business stakeholders oftentimes giving very um, aggressive timelines, um, potentially sometimes unreasonable timelines to complete work. Um, and that can oftentimes frustrate your development team. And so the key of it as a product owner is making sure that you can um, have that balance and be a negotiator that um, you know ensures that you're covering and protecting your team from um, you know, being put in positions that are um, not set up for success. Um, but also being, you know, realistic with your business teams and making sure that um, they understand um, what potential limitations you have um, and what concerns you have from that side. But also in the opposite direction, you need to ensure that your development teams are, are pushing forward. And so they're not getting stuck. Um, they're not um, staying in analysis paralysis for too long and, um, you know, just spinning their wheels, um, not really understanding what the, the overall objectives are for um, your company, um, for, you know, the information technology team overall, and also where your development team sits in that. Um, you know, there's dependencies from other development teams that you have to consider. Um, there's dependencies with different applications and how information is transferred between those. And so having that really high level understanding um, is key. And so uh, one of the things I will say as being a product owner, you have to, you know, be able to uh, be able to go in deep. And so have a good understanding of your technology, but you also have to go wide and have a good breadth of, you know, how your technology stack interacts with other, um, you know, applications and databases and, um, you know, systems, you know, that the organization owns, um, you know, enterprise wide. And so being able to see that and see those dependencies and integrations are key and um, ways that you can stay successful within that space. So again, um, for those who may not be familiar um, with agile development and a traditional scrum team, uh, these are the key players that you usually have. You have your business owner, um, you have um, key stakeholders and subject matter experts. And these individuals have um, large influence over uh, your development team. And so they're the ones who are giving you the business strategy, um, you know, helping to um, develop your overall product roadmap. And um, they're also identifying the key indicators and um, helping to um, hone in the analysis that you're doing to ensure that the products that you're making are actually um, things that your users want and um, are using um, over a period of time. And so these are um, those who um, really have um, guidance in terms of what enterprise-wide we're wanting to do. Um, sometimes uh, you'll have marketing teams involved as well or um, your legal team 
uh, because they need to make sure to cover you both from um, a communication standpoint. Sometimes you're working with, um, again, uh, other departments, whether it's sales or um, even sometimes, you know, uh, individual um, groups that uh, have small influence but are very um, strong, um, you know, users of your product. And so they're going to be able to, to share feedback. And again, these are all things that help to create that roadmap that you have. And then you have your development team. And so um, I, a lot of these players, people are very familiar with, you have your scrum master who is helping to guide and lead the team on a daily basis. Um, you know, they're making sure that there are no roadblocks, that there are no issues um, that are happening on the team. Um, obviously, you have your developers who are, um, you know, writing your code and um, doing development from that standpoint. You have your QA analysts who are testing it, making sure that everything is functioning properly before it goes out into production. You have architects who are giving, um, you know, the overall technical guidance on um, how we're going to solution a certain effort. And so, you know, they're guiding the development team and, you um, you know, the overall technology space in terms of how technology interacts with each other, how data is passing between them. Um, and so they have a really high level understanding of the functionality of a particular product or stack. Um, you also have your business analysts. Um, and I actually have a background as a business analyst and um, something, these are individuals I greatly, greatly respect. Um, these are, uh, you know, very deep, um, understanding of technology. Usually they are the ones articulating your user stories um, into um, digestible um, acceptance criteria. And they're making sure that they're working closely with the QA analysts and the developers to ensure that the developers understand the stories. Um, no questions um, are left unanswered. Everything is very clear for them to consume. And then from a QA standpoint, they're also working with them from a, a testing standpoint, developing acceptance criteria for that testing and ensuring that at the end, we have a fully functioning effort that um, is part of the user story. So these are the main players that are involved. And again, you have in the middle, the product owner who is, you know, carrying between the two. And again, the focus is to make sure that um, neither one um, over extends themselves into e um, the other team space. So what I mean is, is that you're not having a situation and oftentimes this can be the case, but a good product owner will acknowledge and address it is having your business owners, your stakeholders, those of influence um, taking the lead and um, man, uh, managing your technology and, and, and telling you exactly how to execute um, a certain level of development. So I think that's really key to understand that they have um, a vision and we respect that vision, but they are not telling us what technology to use. They're not um, telling us how to build our technology stacks. They're not telling us how to code things. None, none of that should be um, any influence that you're getting from these individuals. At the end of the day, we're making sure we understand what functionality they want. And then from that standpoint, we are ensuring that we are executing um, you know, in the best way possible uh, development that addresses that functionality or that technology need. And so I think that's very key. On the other hand, again, you don't want your development team overshadowing the business um, uh, focus. And I think that's really key too, because a lot of times um, you have situations where, um, you know, you are having deadlines, you are having um, limitations to when um, a certain level of development needs to be completed. And that's where the business, uh, the excuse me, the product owner comes into play. And they're ensuring that we're fulfilling our obligations um, to our business stakeholders. And so, um, you know, again, they're the closer. They're making sure that everything is getting completed on time. You know, they're making sure that the vision 
um, matches the technology and um, they're constantly um, negotiating between the two. Um, never are you going to have a situation where the um, stakeholders get everything they want per se um, within a given period of time, just because there are limitations within a technology space. Um, and at the same time, you know, the development team may have to um, have pressure put on them um, in terms of working forward and making sure that we execute in a timely fashion. And so being able to balance between the two in a reasonable fashion is really key. And again, it's about partnerships. It's about relationships. It's about um, developing trust between your teams so that they know that you have their best interests on both sides and that um, what's going to come out is exceptional work um, that a user will be able to consume and will want to consume um, on a regular basis. So what are some of the top characteristics of a product owner? Um, I think uh, you know, some of the things listed here are very, very key. So understands and embraces the product vision. Again, going back to what I was talking about before, really making sure you understand um, what the overall roadmap and overall vision for the product is. So you're making sure that um, you know what needs to be done in a year, what, you know, the team is um, hoping to do in five years. And so you have that extended roadmap. Again, you understand how that integrates with other technology stacks, other application systems, databases, and um, you know what those key dependencies are and um, how those affect your product as well. You have a immense knowledge about your product. So that's very key. Um, I mean, I, while you are not a developer, um, and you don't need to know um, each line of code and how things are executed, you do have to understand the overall functionality of your technology. And so that's something that um, is very key for a product owner. And so because you're having to talk both to the technology team and um, your business teams, you know, you have to switch between the two and make sure um, you're articulating that business vision into a um, digestible way for the development team so that they're executing exactly what needs to be done and um, not having a situation where there is scope creep, um, but also not um, wavering and um, moving away from the vision as well. So those are really huge key things. And I think to be able to do that, you have to have the ability to be an amazing storyteller. So you really need to be able to um, talk to your development team so they know exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it, and who it is for. And that's very key. So you need to know all of those key um, components to make sure that um, you're staying focused exactly on what needs to be executed when. And um, there are no confusion in terms of what that user experience would look like. And so, um, you know, that's, again, very key that, you know, you're making sure you're writing your stories very thoroughly. And um, from that standpoint, um, what happens is, is that when you do that, um, the developer, you know, writes the proper code. Um, the tester tests the functionality exactly as it should be and be able to identify any bugs that are outside of that parameter. And then when it's handed back to um, the business teams, it's exactly what they were looking for um, and, and probably uh, functions even better than they anticipate it because for them, you know, it's just a concept, but when you are working with your development team, you're turning it into reality. And so when you're able to take that vision um, in someone's head and turn it into something that is tangible, that's very huge. And being able to articulate that is key. Um, you also need to be empowered to lead your teams. So again, you need to have that balance and you need to have that trust. So um, to be able to be empowered, um, you need to have your business teams feel that you are capable of executing their vision. And so they need to have trust that you can do that. From your development standpoint, you also need to have trust um, from them to 
understand that you know what you're talking about in your technology space and you understand the functionality, understand the limitations, understand the integrations and um, can speak to them on that level as well. And so um, when you have that, you have respect on both sides and um, you're able to command strategy in a way that if someone does not have confidence in their product owner, probably wouldn't convey. From the business standpoint, you probably will be micromanaged. Um, and then from a development standpoint, you will constantly be questioned um, within your leadership. And so um, to have that balance, you really need to have that knowledge. You really need to um, manage those relationships and establish that you know exactly what you're doing and people can trust your vision to move forward. Again, you have to have a clear focus on functionality. Going back um, to creating good user stories, you need to understand how um, you know, a button is going to work, how a drop down is going to work, how an error treatment is going to work. You need to think about all of those things when you're looking at a specific um, set of um, development work and um, factoring all those items in because a lot of times, sometimes we're looking strictly at what's happening when you, you know, do one simple command, but there are a lot of other factors that come into play with that. And so really understanding all of your, um, you know, use case scenarios that you have um, and really thinking through, you know, different, um, you know, options when you're regression testing is very key and just making sure that you have all of those factored in so that way you don't miss anything and a bug doesn't come into place. Um, another thing is you need to be available and present to your team and that's huge. You need to uh, be um, able to at any you know opportunity um, be able to have a conversation with your business analyst and um, be able to enhance stories. You need to have a discussion in refinement with developers and making sure that they have a clear understanding of the work that's about to take place in a sprint. Um, you need to be able to, um, you know, have that quick conversation with your business stakeholders when you realize that uh, potentially, um, you know, stories may go over and um, have to roll over into another spit, or um, it's looking like, you know, your goal of completing the work in September is actually going to happen in um, January. And you need to be able to negotiate your case and um, find reason in that. And, um, you know, again, going back to consistency, going back to that trust level. Um, you know, if your business team doesn't trust you, they may not be as forgiving and as flexible with you um, in terms of um, negotiating new deadlines or new dates. Um, you know, in, in the opposite direction, you know, at development team may really push back on um, a certain um, level of functionality or, um, you know, uh, the volume and capacity for your backlog. And so, again, having um, conversations around that um, and making sure that everybody understand um, what's happening and constantly over communicating, I think that's very key. And that goes into my next one, having strong communication skills, being able to, you know, always be sharing um, you know, your current events, you know, progress that's happening, um, challenges that are happening, blockers that are happening, um, and being able to address those blockers immediately. That is very key in making sure that um, you're able to support the team in that capacity is huge. So, um, you know, spend, you may spend a lot of time in email, a lot of time um, in, you know, video conferences right now, because we're doing a lot of Zoom, but, you know, um, Oh, so in-person meetings, you know, you're sitting in there, you know, hours on end and um, you need to be able to um, at any given time um, be able to articulate the status of the team, um, what uh, areas of focus they are working on and um, what challenges they may be having and what success they're having. And so I think, you know, being able to have that in your, the back of your head at all times is huge. Um, you also have to be a great listener. And when I say this, what I mean is, is that not only do you have to be a active listener, but you also have to be hearing what may not be said, but inferred. And um, what I mean by this is, especially when you're talking to um, your business teams, a lot of times, again, they like to focus on um, 
technology. Uh, you know, in many of my experiences, uh, sometimes teams focus on um, a technology that would solve a problem instead of really truly looking at what the problem would be. And so a perfect example of this is, you know, maybe wanting to purchase um, a very expensive database management system um, for a uh, business unit that has a very small um, operation. And what you may hear is that they want to use this technology to address the problem, but it may be actually that they just need Excel to address that issue. And so you could save um, your company hundreds of dollars by just being a very active listener and, and, and focusing strictly on the problem and not necessarily technology to address that. While technology does help problem solve, um, it's the right technology that can help problem solve. And so I want to emphasize that is that, um, you know, you want to be able to identify how to address that. And, and it's not always by purchasing a new product or having the latest and the greatest. What it is, is really understanding um, your users, what their needs are and how to address them. Um, you know, another characteristic and something that we talk about takes backlog refinement seriously. So that's something that um, uh, can be very dangerous if you don't. If you're not engaged with your team as they're developing stories, if you're not engaged with them as um, you know they're asking questions and they're talking through the solution, um, that can be a very um, troubling position for you to be in. One, you don't know how things are being developed. You don't know. Um, how to communicate that to uh, your business stakeholders. And um, also, again, that shows, um, um, it will basically cause a lack of respect from your, your, your development team and also your business team, because again, you don't know what's going on. And so you can't give that um, you know, snapshot that you need to give at all times. And so you seem kind of out of place. So what happens is, is that um, you're not really in the middle of the communication relationship, like the graph that I showed, what, where you're at is um, kind of on the outskirts. And so when you're when that happens, um, you're not leading your team. Um, and so a lot of things can happen. Um, you know, the vision of where the technology should go transitions, um, you know, people get confused you know, stories are not being completed properly or with the right capacity. Um, there's just a lot of confusion and frustration that goes around with that. So again, staying engaged with your backlog and with your teams in that capacity is huge. Um, product owners are natural problem solvers. Um, that's one of the things I love about this. I'm always solving problems, whether it's a, a large um, technology project that's going to take uh, two years, or I'm just merely, you know, solving a simple, um, you know, style um, challenge that we have. And so redesigning um, a page that already exists, but just making it so that it's more functional. Um, again, being able to identify and problem solve is key. And again, knowing how to problem solve. It, it, it's not always a large piece of technology or uh, a rewrite of code. Sometimes it's just understanding, again, the problem, addressing it in the proper manner and um, executing it um, focused on the user. Um, product owners can code switch for appropriate audience. And um, what I mean by code switching is you either go in deep and you're talking to your technology teams, um, you know, from a technical standpoint or you're talking high and wide with your business teams and you're speaking to business strategy, you're speaking to marketing, sales, um, you know, analytics, and um, those are important as well. And so being able to have a depth and a breadth of knowledge and being able to speak to the audience that you're in front of, no, I'm not going to be talking about lines of code with my um, business owner. 
um, that is something that is not a concern to them. But what they do want to know is, you know, what are the percentages of users? Has there been an increase? Have we seen, um, you know, traffic volume increasing in a certain space? Things of that nature. They care about that. In the same vein, um, if I talk at a very high level with the development team, um, they're not going to understand what they need to execute. So we're having conversations about, um, you know, the approach for applications, um, you know, what uh, the UX design looks like, how that can be articulated into functionality. And so you're having those discussions with them. And so being able to know, you know, which between the two and, um, you know, and in um, IT, people move around. So sometimes you have uh, business stakeholders who have a technology background. And so, you know, don't be surprised if you have to switch that and have that type of conversation. Or you have product owners who may not have familiarity of your tech stack. And so you may have to talk very um layman's terms with them about what you're doing so that way they can understand that and um, know the dependencies to be able to execute that with their team. And so just know um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you only talk high level with the business team and only um, depth with technology teams, but it can, you know, intersect between the two. And again, it's just knowing who you're talking to, what they respond to, and making sure you speak at that level with them. This is a key one being able to be comfortable to say no. That is a huge one. Um, if you're the type of person who uh, uh, antagonistic or um, challenging conversations are hard, this is gonna be um, something that you're gonna have to grow into and develop because uh, as a product owner, you really need to put your foot down sometimes. And you have to put your foot down sometimes with both groups. Um, and with all kinds of individuals, um, not even necessarily your, your business owners um, and stakeholders or your technology team. Sometimes you're dealing with outside influences from other teams or, um, you know, other individuals. And you need to know um, when to say no. I think um, one of the challenges is if you're trying to be a product owner and be a people pleaser, you're going to basically... I'm being eaten alive, just to be honest. Um, you are going to be in a situation where you're going to be um, over promising and under de delivering to everyone. And again, that is not a place to be in. You need to be able to um, trust your gut and really, you know, know when um, something can happen and a timeline cannot be made and you can't agree upon, um, you know, these expectations and, be able to manage expectations. So again, you want to be able to um, limit the risk to your team. And so by promising things that are unrealistic, that's not going to help your team at all. What you want to do is be in a position of success um, and always, um, you know, refer to the counsel um, of your developers. That's another thing too. Like you need to lean hard on your architects and your development team, your QA analysts and your business analysts as you're going through, um, you know, you, your evolving um, backlog because they're going to tell you where the challenges are, where the weaknesses are. And, um, you know, when you're going to your business stakeholders and they're saying, can you get this done? You know, the first thing I do is I go to my technology leadership and say, hey, are these really realistic expectations? Can we trust to say that we can? And so, you know, there may be hesitation and that's where you have to push your team to say, okay, maybe there are limitations, but let's take on reasonable risk and move forward. So you got to say no um, on both sides. Sometimes you have to say no um, to your development team because we need to move along and meet the requirements of the business. But at the same time, you know, you need to um, set your team up for success. And so it's really key that when you're having those discussions that you're saying, hey, based on what I'm seeing, um, you know, our team could possibly do this. It might be a little aggressive, but we're going to push them to make sure it happens or vice versa that, um, you know what, this is really not possible. And I don't even want to put ourselves in a position to make promises that we can't keep. And so being able to have that type of agreement and you think people would be 
you know, well, let me put it like this. Some people will be upset with you, but at the end of the day, I think um, when people see that you can manage that balance between the two and you can execute and you, whatever you say um, is possible, people are going to respect you. And so, um, you know, at first it can be a little um, nerve wracking because you're, you know, you're saying no, you're making people a little upset, you know, you're pushing people's buttons, but at the same time, over time, they're going to respect that because they realize you're coming from a place of knowledge and that you're not just saying it um, just to say it. Um, you're saying it because you have used your deductive reasoning and um, been able to share, um, you know, from your either per past experience or, you know, just from your knowledge of um, the space you're working in that certain things are going to happen in a certain way and being able to speak from a place of confidence and knowledge is key. And if you do all these things, I think what happens is you're able to exceed your customer's expectations. So again, you're able to um, not only make your development team happy because they're working under reasonable boundaries, um, your stakeholders are happy because what they envisioned in their head is being executed in a functional manner. And then the top person of all, your user, is going to um, love your product, want to use it more, and um, you know, you'll see increased return on investment um, by that standpoint. Some of the other questions people might have are what type of education and background is required? A lot of times you'll see when you have um, product owner um, job requirements, uh, people often reference um, requiring a bachelor's degree. Um, so four-year degree program a lot of times is asked, preferred, uh, focus in computer science, engineering, or economics. Now, that's not to say that someone who doesn't have a degree um, would ever be offered a product owner job. And that's not, a, um, not to say that someone who has a technology background will not be offered um, a product job. Just to give you a little sense of my story, um, how I got into technology was from a completely opposite space. I actually was working in nonprofit. I was a fundraiser and a nonprofit event manager. And, um, you know, what happened was during um, the 2008 recession, um, you know, it was just very tough. So I ended up um, transitioning into another job and um, a person that I was very close to was um, going to be the top salesperson at a startup company. And so um, for me, that's really how I got it um, involved. I started off as a product specialist, um, transitioned into a business analyst and um, you know, now I'm a product owner, but I didn't start off as a developer or a QA analyst or even a systems analyst. I, I was not in technology, you know, had um, someone asked me, I would, you know, tell me that I would be in this space, um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, I would have never thought this, you know, when I was coming out of college, um, I, I wasn't aware of the product owner role. I wasn't aware of a business analyst. I, I only knew that there were developers and that's who was involved with um, IT. And so you had your guys who wrote code and they had to have, you know, strong math backgrounds and understand calculus and um, all the things that I really was interested in, but never very strong in. And so um, for me, again, learning about this, understanding that anybody could be a product owner, um, I think is very powerful and um, really understanding that um, everybody has a place in IT is key. And, and again, you just need to be passionate about it and passionate about what you're doing um, to be successful. So um, there are oftentimes people climb through the ranks um, through their professional growth at a company. And so um, you know, having a specific knowledge in a certain technology stack or having experience being a systems analyst, uh, you know, subject matter expert in a different area, you know, what happens is, is that you just become so familiar in an application or a certain area of technology. And um, it's a very easy transition to become 
um, you know, a business analyst or a QE analyst or even go into development and um, then transition over into a PO. And so that's what we find is a lot of people who um, are POs actually started off in other IT positions. So a lot of times they were business analysts, um, but, you know, there are many developers and again, many system analysts and um, that have transitioned um, into the product space. And so um, it's really uh, wonderful because you have all of these different backgrounds. Sometimes they're, um, you know, uh, designers and, um, you know, work in um, user experience. And so you just have all these people with all these different backgrounds that really add to the product space. And I think that's what I really enjoy is that there's so many different diverse people who end up in product. And I think um, the fun part is, is that because there's so many different backgrounds and stories that have evolved into the product space that you get such a unique feel to how, um, you know, different technology is developed because, you know, my background, you know, being a non a nonprofit and, you know, not having a lot of money and not having a lot of resources, I'm going to be a uh, immediately quick to uh, be creative when it comes to certain items. Um, you know, someone who has more of a technology um, background, you know, may be able to reference, you know, different applications or systems that they use in the past that can help to integrate and solve a solution much faster than me who may not have familiarity in that, um, you know, and then someone who's very um, familiar with user experience, again, they, they may focus on um, creating design that um, enhances and addresses the problem in, in a certain capacity. And so, um, you know, I emphasize nothing, no background is greater or stronger than another. Um, you know, what it really comes down to is that you have to have a deep understanding of, and love for user experience, um, making sure that you're solving problems for those who are using your products. Um, an interconnection between applications and systems, you really need to understand, you know, how different systems flow together and um, when they break and how to address those. And then the last thing is just really having deductive reasoning, being able to be, you know, uh, a problem solver in the sense of, you know, a detective, you're going in um, and you're identifying, you know, what the problem is, how to address that problem and finding an efficient products, um, you know, functionality, technology solutions that can help to address that. And so um, that's really key. So if you want some additional resources or information, I, I wanted to share some things with you. Um, first and foremost, um, if you really wanna dive in, um, some of the top things to look at is the Agile Manifesto. Um, for many of us who are in the Scrum space, this is one of the first things um, you know, you're introduced to and, and talk about. Um, and that shares the basic tenets of Agile um, and the stated values of it. Um, the other item that you can focus on is also the Scrum Guide. Um, this is a definitive manual describing Scrum um, written by Jeff Sutherland and Ken um, Schwaber. In addition to that, there's a lot of great organizations that are focused on product and product development. And um, that is the Product School, Mind Product, Product Coalition, and the Product Development and Management Association. Um, you also have Scrum um, certifications, and um, you also have, you know, free courses. And um, one of them to highlight is the product strategy um, course by Northwestern and their Kellogg School of Management. And there's tons of free courses on Coursera and edX as well. These are some of the sites that I, um, resources that I cited. And lastly, I just want to thank you guys for um, sitting with me. Um, if you have any questions or want to reach out to me, don't hesitate. Um, I am on LinkedIn at mjones25, and I am on Instagram, Twitter, and also Clubhouse as Miss Digital Name. So thank you again for everything um, you guys have done by participating and attending my presentation. I look forward to hearing from you guys again. Take care. Thank you for spending time with us. Please like and subscribe to our channel because we share weekly content to support your tech and Salesforce learning journey. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss a new video. 
We also handpick these videos, which we recommend you watch next. Connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and on 100daysoftrailhead.com. All of which are listed below. Thank you for learning with us, and we'll see you back tomorrow.